Put a care team in place today. Period. Full stop. No ifs, ands, or buts. You, if you think that you can manage this disease until they're gone, I would like people to understand that my mom had Alzheimer's for 20 years. So let's just take a step back. This is the fall of 2021. So why don't you tell me what Thanksgiving of 2041 will look like? I'll wait. I have no idea what next week will look like, and we're leaving for vacation. So I can't even imagine what 20 years from now would look like. And you just have no idea how long this will last, what their changes will be. I know I've talked to some people whose loved ones go from diagnosis to death in a few years. So the progression is super fast. I don't know which one's worse personally, since I never experienced fast. I, I can't really, I would think 20 years is worse, but we had a lot of times where she just plateaued. Welcome to the All's Authors Podcast. We're so glad you found us. I'm Marianne Shuko, a registered nurse, author, and dementia daughter. Join me each week to listen to one of our authors talk about their dementia journey, sharing intimate details and painfully obtained knowledge to help others currently on that path. We hope these stories offer you comfort and support as we strive to break the silence and stigma surrounding a dementia diagnosis. May one of our authors speak to your experience. Content presented on the following podcast is for information purposes only. Views and opinions expressed during this podcast are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent views of the Whole Care Network. Always consult your physician for medical and fitness advice and always consult your attorney for legal advice. And thank you for listening to the Whole Care Network. Jennifer Fink is the daughter, granddaughter, and great-granddaughter of three women who have succumbed to Alzheimer's or other cognitive impairments. Her quest to discover how not to become the fourth generation in her family with this condition, while also seeking ways to better connect with her mother, led her to her new passion, podcasting. She is the producer and host of Fading Memories, a podcast that listens, hears, and offers wisdom and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience. Jennifer discovered long ago that podcasts are an easily accessible way to learn new things. She could walk the dog or do housework while learning about a variety of topics. But when she searched for shows that might help her find answers to her many questions about Alzheimer's, she did not find what she was looking for. So she decided to create one herself. In its fourth season, Fading Memories focuses on conversations with people who offer resources and ideas for whatever stage of dementia your loved one is in. It's part helpful information and part true stories from caregivers like you and is for anyone caring for a loved one with Alzheimer's or dementia. In this episode, we discuss the importance of estate planning sooner rather than later dealing with a difficult sibling and caregiving, and how cycling kept her sane. Hi, Jennifer. Welcome to the All's Authors Podcast. How are you today? Doing great. Thanks so much. Oh, I'm so glad you came. I've known you for a long time. I've watched your transformation as a fledgling podcaster with your mom's uh, Alzheimer's journey. Over the years, and I was a guest on your show quite a while back. I remember that. Mm -hmm. And I've just seen you blossom into a real professional. Your podcasts have gotten better and you have excellent guests. And your blog and your whole platform provides so much helpful information for caregivers. Thank you for doing that. Thank you. I was looking for... Easily accessible information while I was working and taking care of my mom. I'm a reader, which is a good thing for you guys. But, you know, sometimes yeah, it's, you can only read so many things on how to take care of a loved one. And then you need to switch to a murder mystery or something a little lighter. <laughs> so I searched for a podcast in late 2017. 
there was one and I don't know if better or worse, it wasn't my cup of tea and I insanely decided to start my own. So here I am three and a half years later. Yeah, I think so. I can do math <laughs> Yeah, in season four, but it's been three and a half years. So the numbers confuse me. <laughs> mm -hmm. So no, I, I recommend the podcast for people who are looking for real life stories. And that's what all's authors likes to specialize in. For the most part, the majority of our authors have walked the walk and they are sharing what they've learned on the way because it's such hard one knowledge. And mainly the attitude is if I can help somebody else, then it makes my experience worthwhile. So welcome to all's authors. And I want you to tell us a little bit about your caregiver experience, because I know that your mom passed away not too long ago, so it's still fresh. And if you could share with us um, your journey and how it came that you learned about your mom's dementia and any kind of changes you had to make in your life at that time to care for her. Okay, well, let's see. I'm going to back up one step. In the mid 90s, I think 1995, 96, my maternal grandmother had a brain aneurysm that leaked for three months. And she ended up with what I have been told was vascular dementia, although I don't think she ever was formally diagnosed. And so I was very familiar with memory loss and those issues because of her. But also about the same time, my mom was about 53. She's, we had a family business together and she would frequent, not frequently in the beginning, but in the beginning she would occasionally take an order from a client with no due date, no <laughs> instructions, <laughs> nothing useful to get it done in the, the time the client was expecting. And it was really easy to dismiss in the beginning because as most people know, you know, the door... The doorbell rings and somebody new comes in or the phone rings or you put the order down and you go use the bathroom. I mean, it's easy to become distracted and it didn't happen often enough to assume that it wasn't something other than just distraction, but it kept happening more and more frequently. My grandmother was getting worse and worse. I sometimes wonder if she also had Alzheimer's or some other undiagnosed dementia because just having the her memory loss and her loss of function doesn't seem to track a hundred percent with the brain damage from the aneurysm. So this is my, my armchair medical degree working in here. So I was very familiar with what was going on with her and, but I was concerned about my mom in the early two thousands, the not taking not writing down directions and, you know, providing information. So myself or the employees could, complete orders for clients and a proper, you know, correctly and timely and as expected. And I commented to her one day, I had, I had started, if I heard her, you know, basically chewing the fat with a client, I would go out front and go like, oh, what are we doing for Marianne today? And kind of insert myself into the conversation so that I could hopefully subtly find out what we were supposed to do, make sure the forms were filled out. And if not, I could be like, oh, what, when did you want to pick that up again? And I was hoping I was really subtle about it. And this one day I'd found an order that had no directions, no nothing. It was just photographs in a work envelope. And I was just like, oh my God, you know, it's like how, this is not how I want to start my day. My mom came in and I said, what are we doing for Marianne? I held the, the order up and she goes, I don't know. That's so-and-so's handwriting referring to one of the employees. And I was like, uh, no, not even similar handwriting, I'm like almost opposite style of writing. I was like, this is not good. And so I told her at the time, I said, you know, I'm starting to get worried because, you know, you used to have these daffy moments, you know, a couple times a week, but they're starting to happen more frequently. And she looked at me and she goes, I do not want to end up like my mother turned around and stomped off away from me. And I was like, well, that's useful. And so unfortunately my mom was not um, accepting of help or even I think she just was in denial for a long time. And I'm beginning to wonder, or I have wondered in the past if she 
have the agnosinosia, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that right, where you basically don't know what you don't know. So it wasn't denial. It was actually not knowing that she was having these moments. Could have been both. So that was in like the early aughts. And in 2008, she went through all the testing to donate a kidney to my dad and was rejected because of cognitive impairment. And at that point, so my daughter was a junior in high school and I was like, yes, finally, we got a diagnosis. And my dad took care of her. You know, my sister and I tried to help. I recommended, I think this was in 2013 or 14. I, you know, he had his own chronic illnesses. So, and he had zero patients. So she would ask him a question two or three times and he would explode, which is, it's not good for any of us, period. Definitely didn't help with somebody who was having memory issues. So I recommend, I researched and found a adult day program, talked to them. I did all of the legwork. All we needed to do was go over there and visit. And he flatly refused. And I'm like, I don't know how to help you if you won't let me help you. So fast forward to November 29th, 2016, my husband, my daughter, and I went over to their house to put up Christmas decorations for them. You know, my mom was way, you know, you know, mid to late mid of stages of her disease. I still thought it was dementia because nobody ever told me it was Alzheimer's. And my husband walked in the door and my husband, my father looked at him and goes, oh, how's the credit union life been treating you? My husband was like, uh, I haven't been in the credit union business in 13 years. What is going on here? So it turns out my husband, my husband, my dad's donated kidney was failing and the toxicity caused him to have memory issues, which I now recognize that he was having it further earlier in the year than I had been aware of but compared to my mom he was he was still quite fine <laughs> and that was that was when our lives turned around because we had to you know take care of my mom while he was in the hospital we had to bounce her between my house my sister's house her my mom's sister my aunt would go to their house and take care of my mom and it was just a nightmare for 32 days finally got dad out of the hospital had him on hospice and we had 24-hour caregivers at their house and it just, it was literally from November 29th to May, May, March 2nd, 2017 was just like one giant stress after another. My dad passed away on March 2nd, 2017. And we had decided that we moved my mom into memory care two weeks later, which was not fun. So then I was the one in charge of, you know, visiting and all of that stuff. And Part of the process of moving her into the memory care, I, you know, I had to get paperwork from her doctor's office. And I basically told the doctor at the time, I want to see her diagnosis. I want to know, like, what is exactly going on? My mom was not formally diagnosed with Alzheimer's till September of 2011. This is like 12 or 14 years after we started having issues. So it was a very long process to get her diagnosed. And it was shocking that she wasn't formally diagnosed after being denied being a donor because of cognitive issues. So I really don't understand how that whole process didn't work for her. I know it was a lot on her part, not blaming the doctors. Although I think we need to do a lot more education for our medical professionals. In trying to find ways of having good quality visits. She was at the stage where she would literally ask the same question every two minutes. I used to visit on Mondays. I would, on Mondays, pre-pandemic, I would go to the gym, go home, shower, dress, go to our rotary meeting and go visit with my mom. So I was, she'd say, well, what have you been up to lately? Oh, I went to the gym this morning and did spin class and ooh, it was hard. End of statement. Two minutes later. So what have you been up to lately? So then I would tell her I went to the rotary meeting, which my dad was a Rotarian. So that was something she was familiar with to another two minutes. So what have you been up to lately? Oh, I went to the gym and then I went to rotary and I saw so-and-so naming somebody that she might've remembered. And it went on and on. And then when I ran out of things that I could actually honestly answer, then it, we we're like 20 minutes into the visit. And I just kind of wanted to run headlong into the, you know, stucco walls outside, which 
It's not good for your brain. So I was looking, reading books, doing deep internet searches. This is before I found all his authors. And I was, I was literally coming up with suggestions that never worked for my mom. The whole music thing, bust. You know, looking at old photographs, that didn't work either. I mean, it was just like, I was like, why is she the anomaly? Why, why did none of these things work? Partly, she was much further along in the disease than I was aware of. So then, you know, back in the days when we did these things, like driving a car to a gym, I got the idea to look for a podcast for Alzheimer's caregivers. And I know there's podcasts on everything. So I was confident that there would be plenty. And there was one. So this was like November of 2017. And so one of the podcasts I was listening to at the time was called The Side Hustle School. It's they're usually eight to 12 minute long episodes, which was the perfect amount of time to get to the gym. And they had a bonus episode on starting your own podcast. I'm like, yeah, I think I might do that. <laughs> so that's how I started. <laughs> long, long journey. <laughs> yeah, that is quite a story. So, um, you're like a lot of the other uh, authors, you know, the authors who had to write the book that they were looking for on their own journey. They had to create uh, the guide book that they wanted. And so you did that with the podcast. How did you go about finding guests at the beginning? Well, in the very beginning, I arrogantly thought that I had lots of information to share and it did not take very long to realize that I did not. <laughs> And I started talking to people that lived in my town. This was my pre-Zoom days, but that didn't last long. And then they kind of recommended other people. And I started doing things with people that weren't local that I couldn't just go, you know, set up with on the dining room table. And I started using Skype, which was a hit and a miss. And then in September of 2018, so this is about six six months, eight, four months after launching, I did a podcast with another podcaster and he used Zoom. And so that is when I got introduced to Zoom. And of course, now the entire world knows about Zoom because of the pandemic and it just changed everything. And one person led to another. And I don't remember how I found the all's authors, but you guys are just the biggest wealth of information. <laughs> and I love talking to you know, all your authors are so much fun and everybody's story is so unique and everybody has, you know, everybody's story is unique, but it, they all, there's always something to learn from each person, even though our journeys are very similar. So I'm hoping to get back to the all's authors because you guys have a lot of good ones coming up or that have come up. Yeah, we do. We have many, many more coming up. It's something that has a <laughs> life of its own. So, um, well, let me see. What's been the what's been the response to the to your podcast and your and your blog too? Because in the website, how did how did the website come about? Well, originally I started with just kind of a basic one that you know you need, as you know, you need a, a an audio hosting company and you need a website that pushes the podcast out to the podcast players. That was a good learning uh, process, good dynamic learning, good 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 some brain cells working for me there. And I forgot, I had a guy that helped me set up my YouTube channel just because I'm a Mac person. I've been an Apple computer user since 1982. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> which for a lot of your audience is probably not that far back, but for some people, it just seems like a whole different life ago. And there was just certain things that just, I'm like, I'm doing it the way the direction saying it's not working. And I know it's me and it's just, I, I just didn't speak enough Google to make it work. So I hired a guy to, to do what I wanted just to keep the frustration level down. And he recommended adding articles and, and various things to boost the search engine optimization. And then I got ideas to add curated recipes that are good for people that are taking care of a loved one that mm -hmm. might be getting to the stages where they need to, you know, eat with their fingers or, you know, they need, they don't like to drink water. So I have a great creamsicle popsicle recipe. It's like pff, the best thing in the world and a fudgesicle one. So I started there and it just, it just, you know how these things are. They just sort of keep growing. Yeah. <laughs> like they a mushroom. Weed. They mushroom. Mm-hmm. And it's been fun because it's just, it's different. 
you know, it's more positive aspects. You know, I, I find a new recipe that I like and I'm like, oh, this one will be good for somebody that was like my mom. So I'll add it to the website. And, you know, it's just, I try to make it a place that you can kind of like check in on and say, is there something new that I hadn't seen before that might help with what I'm doing? Mm -hmm. So that's basically how it morphed. <laughs> so at the time when you were launching all of these new endeavors, um, going out of your comfort zone, like I did, having to learn all this new technology. You were also working as a photographer and caring mm -hmm. for your mom. And, and what else did you have on your plate? Well, I'm a Rotarian. So there's a lot of community service and stuff that we do, taking care of my mom, taking care of myself. I had at the time three golden retrievers. Unfortunately, we also lost one of them last year. Mm. 2020 was rough. Yes. So it's just, you know, going from having a mom that was obviously having cognitive issues in my early 30s to losing my dad at 50, it was just a lot. <laughs> I don't, when I think back on it, I think, man, that was a treacherous couple of, couple of decades that I'm not repeating. <laughs> yeah. So how did you manage to maintain sanity during all of that time? What did you do for your self-care other than the gym? Well, I love cycling. I kind of fell into that sort of by accident. I started at the gym. Most of my listeners know my dad's side of the family. We have the obesity gene, which I inherited. There's also a tremendous amount of diabetes, which I was determined not to inherit. And so I went in 2008 on a significant weight loss journey to avoid diabetes, which thankfully I have done that, but I didn't know at the time that it would um, also help prevent Alzheimer's. So thank goodness for that. And I did a lot of spin classes and our rotary club started doing, participating in a, a, a cycling event to raise money for a veterans PTSD um, live in program. It was up in Napa or yeah, like next to Napa. And the first year they did it, I was like, Oh, I could never do that as I'm spinning on the spin bike, right? The second year, I'm like, I could probably do the 15 mile bike ride, you know, but I only have the spin bike that isn't even mine. That'd be tricky. And then the third year they did it, I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm really kind of interested in doing this. And we went to a conference in Napa for the rota ro a rotary conference and we rented mount or hybrids and did like, they always have activities, like, you know, how every convention conference does. And we rode with this group of cyclists and they loved to smack talk us. Cause they're like, oh, spinners think they know what they're doing. They can ride, they think they're strong. And I mean, these guys were giving us the business. And I'm like, dude, in spin class, there is no coasting. There is no going downhill. It's all pedaling all the time. It's either hard or harder. And so we kept up with them and that made me feel good because I have a bit of a competitive streak. And then we rented bikes and did a wine tasting cycling event. And I don't drink because I prefer to eat sugar. And I loved it. And I decided that day, I'm like, because this was October of 2012, I'm like I am buying us bikes for Christmas. And I did. And like 15 months later, I did a 50 mile bike ride. It was an all women's bike ride and the, the hybrid puts your arms and your shoulders in one position. And so my neck and my shoulders felt like I'd been clobbered by Godzilla. And so I upgraded to a road bike. I just love getting out on my bike and just going and pedaling. And, you know, I get I ide creative ideas. You know, the sunshine is great for your mind and your body. And so Post pandemic, I am now the proud over owner of a Peloton. So the days I don't go out on my bike, I'm also doing a Peloton routine. My other self-care is being creative. And my pandemic hobby is to make handmade greeting cards. Because I did not want a hobby that added clutter to your house. We only need so many quilts or Afghans or scarves or paintings on the wall or knickknack thingies. I'm like, I don't, I want to get into that. By the time you get good at that, you have so many ugly things. <laughs> like what do you do with them? So I made greeting cards. I gave them to the residents where my mom lived. I figured that was a great place to get rid of the early, 
early incantations of my creativity and they were cute. They weren't, they weren't bad, but in the, in the year that I've been doing greeting cards, I've learned a lot. So I think they're better now. I hope yeah. <laughs> So that's my self care playing with the dogs, riding my bike, making cards. Awesome. It's so important for caregivers to have some outlet for themselves, even if it's just for an hour a day or maybe even less. Hopefully they like to read, but we know that people in general don't read as much as they should, but they can listen. So they can listen to your podcast and mine. And there mm -hmm. are several others out there as well that we are affiliated with. What would you say was the most difficult task that you faced as a caregiver? Hmm. My mom, as the disease progressed, got more insistent that she didn't need help. The more help she needed, the less of it she wanted. Mm -hmm. So you had to be really like super sneaky mm -hmm. on how to get her to do things. Let me think. So this was 2018. I, every time I'd go visit, she was wearing the same sweater. Well, okay. You know, once a week is not a big deal. And I got in my car one day after a visit and I was like, and this is going to crack people up, I hope. But I was like, my car smells like old lady nursing home. This is not cool. So I drove to the gym with the windows down. <laughs> I'm like, I, this is not cool. So the next time when I went and visited, I asked the care staff, the gal that did a lot of things for my mom, if they were having difficulty with her changing clothes. And she says, oh, yes. And she's giving us trouble with showers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, my mom, we, what I did with my mom she enjoyed we would go we would go to the park or the pool or wherever and she would watch kids play and it was nice because i could relax or i could respond to emails on my phone which you know 54 is not as easy as it would would have been 30 years ago <laughs> but it, it just it gave her joy it got her out and this one particular day i got her to wade into the pool so when we went back to the care home I, you know, I quickly remembered, oh, didn't you want to wash off the sweat and the dirt and the chlorine before dinner? And she looks at me and she goes, I did. I'm like, yeah, you know, we were out there getting all sweaty and, and yucky from the pool. And so I actually helped give her a shower, but man, it took a lot of basic creative lighting to get her in that shower. Mm. And I have since learned, and I like to share this tidbit with everybody that People suffering from any kind of dementia, it's not uncommon that the water hitting their skin is actually painful, mm -hmm. which I had heard, but I have a past guest that has FTD, frontal temporal dementia, and she has actually confirmed that in her advocacy that she does on Twitter, she has talked about that. And I was like, yes, proof positive right from the horse's mouth. This is great. And the other thing that she mentioned is they had their shower retrofit or, you know, redone so that it was just a walk in, no, no lip and the bars. But she says it's really disorienting because it's all one color. I'm like, well, that makes sense. You know, we, we go in and we, you know, I'm from California, so I get about a two, two minute shower at best these days. <laughs> you know, I used to love long, hot showers and just enjoy the water rushing down the warmth and how it felt. Yeah, you don't really pay attention to the fact that the tile is all kind of one color. You know, mine wasn't, but for the most part it was. And, you know, I try to tell people what she does. She washes her hair in the kitchen sink and she uses rinseless wipes. And I really think care homes should, should consider doing that a lot more because that's what ended up causing my mom's fall is she was fighting with the caregivers after a shower. She reached for her clothes slipped broke her leg you mm -hmm. know two and a half weeks later she was gone you know we just it, it it's learning how to adapt to their needs that is harder than you'd think because you know we, we've grown up with you know respectable people don't eat with their hands well when you forget how to eat with a fork you know fried chicken you know protein muffins none of these things are you know if you have to eat with your hands to get fed, that's not a problem. And a lot of people, you know, they want to shower their loved one every day and that's not necessary. It's actually not even recommended 
most of us don't need the shower every day. We just do. So it's really hard to kind of get over all those things that we learned and adapt their, you know, adapt to their needs. That was, that was really hard. Cause I constantly felt like I was chasing, you know, the answers, like she would change. And then I would try to find out like, well, now what am I supposed to do? And I always felt like I was behind what she was doing. And I wanted to be ahead of the game so that when a change happened, I could be like, okay, now we can implement this plan of mine, <laughs> which never happened. <laughs> mm. That was the hardest part. Yeah. And I also heard um, a couple other theories is that they're reluctant to disrobe in front of strangers. So if they're in a care facility, obviously they're being showered by a stranger. And also when they, when they see themselves in the mirror, they don't recognize the face that looks back at them. And there's always mirrors, usually in the bathroom. So that can be, that true. yeah, that can set them off to be not cooperative. And it is important that, you know, they're kept clean, but they don't have to be bathed every day. I know that as a nurse. Um, if someone said to you today, my loved one has dementia, what would be your response? <laughs> I'm going to sound like I have dementia because this answer is, is my number one answer always. Put a care team in place today. Period. Full stop. No ifs, ands, or buts. You, if you think that you can manage this disease until they're gone, I would like people to understand that my mom had Alzheimer's for 20 years. So let's just take a step back. This is the fall of 2021. So why don't you tell me what Thanksgiving of 2041 will look like? I'll wait. I have no idea what next week will look like and we're leaving for vacation. So I can't even imagine what 20 years from now would look like. And you just have no idea how long this will last, what their changes will be. I know I've talked to some people whose loved ones go from diagnosis to death in a few years. So the progression is super fast. I don't know which one's worse personally, since I never experienced fast. I, I, can't really, I would think 20 years is worse, but we had a lot of times where she just plateaued. And so my suggestion for putting a care team in place goes like this. Write down everything you need to do today and do that for a week so that you, at the end of a week, have a list of your daily tasks that have to get done. You know, the stuff that you just normally do without thinking about it. You know, we have to make meals. We got to clean up. We got to you know, deal with this, that, and the other thing. Then add in the things that happen regularly, but not necessarily daily or weekly. And after a couple weeks, maybe a month, you've got a list of tasks that have to get done, things that you need to maintain your household and your livelihood or your life. Then make a list of all the people that you know. They don't have to be family. They don't all even have to be in the same town. And when you write down, okay, well, Marianne, you know, she's a retired nurse. She's an author. Maybe find, you know, think about what you know about Marianne or Jen and write down like what you think their strongest task, you know, what, what their strong suit is. I do not like to deal with insurance companies or banks. My husband having been in banking for 20 years and now he's been in real estate for 17 all that paperwork and all that legal gobbledygook, that's just his norm. For me, it makes me nuts just thinking about, like just telling you about it makes me a little crazy. So this is not my strong suit. I can cook, organize, I can get stuff done. I don't want to deal with the banks, insurance companies. So write down what, we, what you think their strong suit is so that when somebody says, oh my gosh, I can't believe your mom's got dementia. Is there anything I can do to help? Instead of giving the pat answer of, Oh no, thank you. If I need your help, I'll, I'll let you know. You'll be like, you know what? You might be able to help me with X and you get like one task. Can you set up the online banking bill paying for me? That's just, it's like, it's just one of these things I need to get done. I really don't like doing it. If you could do that for me, that'd be great. Now they've helped. They've taken a frustrating task off your plate and you have not overburden them. You're not constantly going to them asking for more and more help. You're not asking them when they're unprepared. It just makes dealing with all of this so much easier. And it makes it easier for people to say, oh yeah, I can do that. Or, 
oh my God, online banking is not my thing, but I can do this other thing. So it just really makes everybody's life easier. And that leaves you time to take care of your loved one. Going back to where you said they don't like strangers showering them or doing things for them. A lot of people don't want strangers in their home. Mm -hmm. And if you can extend your energy level for months or years, you might not need, you know, hired help for a long time. You probably will need it eventually, but if you can push that out as many years as possible, it's benefits everybody because it's expensive and it's another task that you have. Now you have to manage these people and it's just like, (laughs) it's just too much work to put a care team in place. It's not that hard. Okay. That's excellent advice. I always uh, recommend uh, on the onset of a diagnosis or even suspicion is to get all of your legal paperwork in place, consult your attorney and get that power of attorney and, and the living will and all of that in order, because once the person is diagnosed and it's too late, they can't Mm -hmm. get online papers and you're going to need that. Yeah. I like to, yeah, you will for certain. And a lot of people, you know, they, the older generation, I'm a Gen Xer, so I can say this a little bit, you know, they grew up at a time where you didn't discuss that with your family. Like we had copies of my parents trust. So I knew what was going on. And that was fine, but my dad was open to that, but we didn't discuss it. It was just like, here's the information, put it in the drawer. Whenever you need it, you'll need it. But a lot of people, I've talked to people whose family members refuse. They're not paying the bills because their you know, their cogn- cognitive level has declined to a point where they, they think people are stealing money from them. And they're at that stage where, you know, us, quote, adult child caregivers, which we really need a better term, are like just chasing our tails, trying to get bills paid and not let them not have them think we're stealing from them. And it's just, Oh yeah. Yeah. It's a nightmare. But we did our, our estate planning last summer. So 2020, and I'm going to tell you, it is not that big a deal. They ask you some questions. Our attorney is completely aware of the Alzheimer's risk in our family. So there was extra questions based on that. The hardest part of planning or doing our estate planning is we only have one daughter, one child. And we said, well, obviously everything will go to her. And he looked at us and he goes, and what happens if she goes first? Now we know him really well. And I looked at him and I said, well, that's a horrible question to ask. Mm. And I started thinking about it. I'm like, I don't really have an answer. She does have a fiance. We love him, but they're not married yet, partly because of the pandemic and life. And it's like, huh? You know, and then they, then you start analyzing, well, you know, this, that, me. And after about a month, he came back with like the preliminary paperwork and he says, have we answered that question yet? And I looked at my husband and I said, just give it to the, to the fiance. I don't care. I'll be dead. It won't matter. You know, it's like, that was the worst of it. Like now I don't have to worry about it. We all know what everybody wants for burial or none of us are going to get buried. So that makes it a little easier. You, you, you take that stress off of you. You don't have to worry about it. Now it's like a joke. We know my family's a little bit, we have a little dark sense of humor. So, (laughs) you know, we, we tease each other. My daughter and I want to be, so I I don't know how it works, but they basically ball you up and turn you into a tree. We're like, Oh, that's great. Do we get to pick what kind of tree? So then we discuss the options of, you know, becoming which tree and why, and it's just weird. So it's really not that stressful and scary or depressing. Mm -hmm. If I can decide what to do with my assets, if my daughter goes first, it's no big deal. Just do it. Take that stress off your plate. Yeah, that was um, similar to our experience with my my mom and her husband. They didn't have anything in place, although they had insisted they did. But when it came time to produce it, it didn't exist. So um, we (laughs) went and and, uh, got everything in order, the power of attorney, and it ended up being myself and the healthcare proxy because I'm the nurse. My brother was the co-agent. And a year later, my stepfather was diagnosed with dementia. So we just got, got it in there in time. And that allowed me to just move in and you know take over financial things and get things in order. So uh, I could better take care of my mom because that was my whole objective at that point was to keep her life as peaceful and the life she was used to was as possible. And 
and it, actually it worked out pretty well and they had their burial plans in place. Um, I ended up changing my mom's because we had his, his funeral came first and it was a very small affair and um, where they had moved to was far from everybody else. So um, I was thinking about my mom and I thought, you know, even though I already have arrangements made with this particular funeral home, it doesn't make any sense because it's so far from everybody. Why don't I just choose this other funeral home that my family used, used to use before my mother moved away? And we just went back up to that area and transferred. We would very easily transfer the burial plan from one place to another and the funds and everything went, went seamlessly. So that was a good thing to do. Because she was going to be buried, well, buried have... in that area anyway. We were going to have to try, all these people were going to drive down to Cape Cod and then drive all the way back up to the Boston area. It would make no sense. So uh, That makes sense being from California you don't want to drive all over the place. Yeah. And I'm going to throw out a little pop culture that I, I'm kind of paying attention to this whole Britney Spears conservatorship mm -hmm. thing because I have significant concerns that they are, I mean, I, I'm not, you know, I'm only following it because of the correlation to having conservatorships of a, you know, like one of your parents or your grandparent Obviously, I think she's been in an abusive, very horrible conservatorship. And from what I've understood, from what I've read from legal scholars, is she's in a conservatorship for somebody that would be like your parents or my mom, you know, somebody with dementia. And I'm very concerned that our lawmakers are going to take a sledgehammer to this conservatorships and make it harder for people like us to get them when necessary. So that, to me, is like very large red flags waving. If you don't want somebody else making decisions about your life in, in the end of your life, do your estate planning today. Like it's, like I said, it's not that scary. It's not that depressing. Just do it. You don't want the government or the state or lawyers that have never met your family. You, know, you don't want to put your family through all that either. So yeah, I think I'm probably going to actually hand write letters to lawmakers and basically say, um, before you like, take a sledgehammer to this law, you need to talk to Alzheimer's caregivers because obviously what's going on with Britney Spears is bad. And they're obviously, you know, not every Alzheimer's caregiver treats their person properly. This is unfortunately life, but for the most part, most of us do a good job and, and throw in our own money and time and effort. And that's a whole other podcast episode we could talk about, but Please don't jerk the rug out from underneath that part of caregiving because there was already not enough support. So that's just reemphasizing to your state plan. It's not that big a deal. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. This is Elizabeth Miller, your host of the Happy Healthy Caregiver podcast on the Whole Care Network. Join me every other Wednesday when I share stories and tips from family caregivers who are integrating caregiving with their lives and prioritizing their own health and happiness. Listen to the show on demand at happyhealthycaregiver.com, wholecarenetwork.com, or your favorite podcast platform. See you there. So, um... I wanted to ask you this question. What did you wish you knew at the beginning of your dementia journey that you didn't find out until later? One, that it could actually be that long. Mm. Um, in my support group, I was always one of the, I was, unless an adult child came with their parent who was caring for a spouse, I was always the youngest caregiver who had the person who had Alzheimer's the longest. So I always felt like I got the gold star every time. Because I was the youngest with the longest progression of the disease. And I didn't, I mean, I knew it was memory loss, but even with my grandmother, I didn't realize that they, their brain just deteriorates till they, they forget how to eat. They forget how to use the bathroom. They forget everything. They forget, they just, their brain just loses more and more function all the time. And it kind of goes back to, part of my advocacy and the message I like to put out there is I really think when somebody gets a diagnosis, 
as a society, we need to figure out a way of saying, oh, my gosh, you know, Jennifer's mom's got dementia and, you know, wrap a team around them of legal people and medical people and support people so that, you know, caregivers don't, you know, crumble under the weight of this burden because oh, many of them do, you know, because most of them, they think this, they think it's memory loss and they can use tools to help them remember things. And even that doesn't work. It's just yikes. You know, it's like constantly adapting is, is not easy, but that's what you have to do. That's true. The way you put that constantly adapting, even from minute to minute, it's not even day to day. It can be from moment to moment. Um, and a lot of people, you don't have the capacity to that. And everybody has their own life that they're trying to lead, whether they, they're still working or they have children or grandchildren that they're caring for, or they just don't want to take care of their parent. They don't like their parent. They haven't talked to their parent in 20 years. And now all of a sudden this gets thrust upon them. I mean, those situations exist. And I've talked to people in that situation. So it just compounds everything. And it can be, a I think we time. need a lot. Yeah. We need a lot more and better options than families basically providing billions of dollars of free health care every year. Now that doesn't mean I'm advocating for the government to do all of it. Cause you know, there's just way too many of us in this country to even expect that to be reasonable, which it's not, but there just needs to be a better option than, um, you know, we got millennials that are not working because they're home 24 seven with their parent or a grandparent or both. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if they're, you know, parent, some of them are in their early seventies or late sixties, you know, if they live 20 years, like my mom, these people will be my age trying to start their career in the mid fifties. You know, our, our society is not set up for people in their mid fifties to start, start their careers. Yeah. It's the, another thing we need to change but that's a whole other podcast too so you know we just somehow we need to figure out we need to take away the stigma we need to educate the population it's a big heavy lift <laughs> that were you and i and many many like us are trying to to help do yeah and you're helping with your uh platform so people can find a lot of support and answers there and there's always new questions that come up every day and new situations like with, you know, it sounds like your mom had the early onset uh, Alzheimer's mm -hmm. and um, we're seeing that more and more now. And fortunately, many people are able to maintain high functioning for a very long time, which is great. And there can be maintained some kind of independence. We inter interviewed many of them on the podcast, but um, it can be a problem for people getting started on a career or people who have to leave their career in their forties or fifties and then try to re-enter a decade or more later. It's very hard. Nobody wants to hire people in that age. It's hard, mm -mm. It's hard to ha get a job when you're in like 55. Yeah. And you figure, you know, we're, we're talking post pandemic and our economy and you know, we can't afford to have people just yanked out of the, the, economic engine of our country and we can't afford to have millennials not working and saving for their own retirement and all that you know all of the things that adulthood you know is supposed to have careers families relationships you know working planning for your your retirement and all that i mean what's going to happen they're like bigger than the baby boomers what's going to happen when they don't have any money to retire on because so many of them were taking care of a pa family member mm -hmm. It's terrifying as a Gen Xer. It's like, oh crap, my daughter's a millennial. So I'm like, hopefully we, hopefully we've got plans in place, but you know, that's what this disease, I'm not sure there's enough planning in the world. It's just very hard, yeah. but you mentioned my mom having early onset Alzheimer's. I also think reducing the stigma and educating the globe, you know, no, no, no small feat there. If my mom knew what I know, you know, when, so she was 70, so like 25 years ago, maybe she could have implemented some of the lifestyle changes that would have prolonged her good years. Mm -hmm. Like she, 
She did not have the inherited obesity gene from my dad's side of the family. Obviously, no blood relation there. She could pretty much eat what she wanted and stay at a reasonable weight. So she didn't exercise. She drank two liters of caffeine-free Diet Coke every single day. Um, maddening to me, who I walk past a cookie and gain weight. She could eat sticky, sugary candy every day. Didn't put on weight, but wasn't good for her teeth or her brain. Um, I don't know how her sleep was. I think it was okay. But, she, you know, so she did like one out of the five things. You know, she was stressed because my dad was a difficult person. I mean, like literally everything that I know that we should do that I do participate in to hopefully prevent this disease and in, in myself. Maybe if she had admitted to it back in 1996, she would have, you know, she would have lasted longer in, in a better mental state. That's what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that makes sense. And she was her own worst enemy in that she was in such a deep denial. Mm -hmm. She didn't want to be like her mother. Or, or I was also my maternal great grandmother had what they called senile dementia mm -hmm. back in the day. She died before I was born. So I was born at the end of 66. I don't know. I don't know when she died. I'll have to ask my uncle, but I, I hear, heard stories from my maternal grandmother about her mom filling a bowl, a Tupperware bowl of water and putting it on the stove to boil. Mm -hmm. Not a good scene. <laughs> Probably smelly too. Yeah. Dangerous. Very dangerous. <laughs> yeah. Melting the melting Tupperware is not an ideal uh, smell. You mentioned that you had siblings. Were they of any support to you on this journey? Where did they fit in? Um, I have one sister. She's four and a half years younger than me. In the beginning, we've never seen eye to eye on anything. I do not know how we are biologically related. Mm -hmm. Really don't. Um, we hadn't talked for many years prior to my dad going in the hospital. And for the first year, year and a half of mom being in the care home, you know, I would go visit and then text her and, you know, blah, blah, blah. This is what happened. Mom, this, that, you know, kind of give her an update. But after a while, it was like, these updates are the same. So we both kind of petered off doing that. And then being the older sibling, not having my, you know, my dad, my daughter moved out February 1st, 2017. My dad died March 2nd. So I went through a whole bunch of lifestyle changes all at mm -hmm. once in 2017. Mm. <laughs> and there was things that were stressful that needed to be dealt with. And I was the healthcare power of attorney, just myself. So there was a lot of times I would just be like, this is going on. Here's the decision. And, and I, I look back on this, uh, this is probably a mistake, but in, in my trying not to add to my sister's stress, because she's a very uh, high, high energy person that, kind of goes off the rails fairly easily when things don't go her way it's not pretty so i stopped informing her of things it's like you know i can't remember what was going on but it was just like like the showering and the clothing i just handled it and i didn't i didn't feel like it was it needed a you know a powwow conversation so you know i look back on that now and i'm like i probably should have at least told her what was going on not that she couldn't figure it out but i can see how she probably thought i was like hiding information from her when i was really just trying to protect her from unnecessary stress mm -hmm. it was like this this happened i dealt with it it's done like why do i need to like dredge it up and relive it myself and then have you live it even though now it's over so i had also was told closer to the end of my mom's life one one of the care staff that i was really close to was surprised I had a sister. I'm like, oh, well, you probably don't see her because she comes on the weekends. And she's like, no, I'm here Saturday through Wednesday or whatever it was. And so I described my sister. I'm like, I know my sister's coming. And she goes, I don't, I've never seen her with your mom. I'm like, yeah, she come. My niece is tall, blonde hair. And so I suspect at some point my mom got so difficult that my sister stopped going. So was she a help? Kind of. But we pretty much did our own things on separate tracks for mom. So mm. could have been better, could have been worse. We didn't fight about 
what needed to be done. I also didn't always tell her everything that need that was going on just because it's like, this is a decision and I'm not, I'm not debating it with you. So I, I'm the one that has to make the decision. So I'm making the decision period. Mm-hmm. Probably not the best attitude, but you know, I was not perfect So Yeah. It, it, a lot of families have strife um, due to, siblings different points of views on what needs to be done how they want things done or some people don't even believe there's a problem yeah no we weren't that bad thankfully it just i mean she turned 50 this year so you know pretty much for me 48 years we've never seen anything i don't know how we lived in the same house not peacefully i could guarantee that's you funny. that's why i have one child my husband's an only child and my, and I was like, no way in heck. I was an easy baby. Our daughter was an easy baby. I'm like, I'm not stupid. My sister was a very difficult baby. She had um, this, the valve that empties the stomach into the intestines wasn't formed properly, even though she was three weeks late. So there was a lot of projectile vomit in her, her first year of life, which thankfully at four and a half, I don't remember. So I'm like, I'm not stupid enough to know that or think that an easy baby the first time means we got this down and we know what we're doing and the second one will be easy. I'm like, uh uh-uh, I've seen this. I've seen this happen way too many times. Mm. So, you know, like I said, it could have been worse with her, could have been better. I've heard horror stories like you just mentioned. So I count my blessings that for them, we pretty much kept it together for mom. And that's what it mattered. Mm -hmm. So now that mom's gone, we're on our separate tracks again. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Where can listeners find the podcast? Oh, on all the podcast apps, Apple, Spotify, Google, the website for my podcast is fading memories, podcast.com. Quick, funny story about that. Always had long pod or website names. Even my photography studio had a longish one just because of crazy things, but I went to look for um, fadingmemories.com, pulled up the, you know, the, the lit, you know, where you buy the domain names from. And I was like, it does not say almost $36,000. I'm hungry. It's time for lunch. So I went, had some lunch, went back. I'm like, it really does say almost $36,000. What in the, what, like, seriously? So it turns out that Fading Memories is a movie, a book, and I think a band. And I then debated, well, do we do like for FadingMemories.net, FadingMemories.help? And I'm like, nobody understands those funky extensions. So it ended up FadingMemoriesPodcast.com. <laughs> well, it works. It makes sense. That's exactly what it is. It's just hard to type on a phone, or at least for me. Yeah, Fat thumbs, I guess. Yeah, once, once you get in there, you save it. And then you don't have to worry about right. That's- F-A-D. That is true. Right up. And you put it in your favorites and your podcast, you follow it officially and uh, it'll show up in your library. So you won't have any trouble. And then you'll get yeah, you don't... notices when there's a new episode. Which is every Tuesday, although season four, I have taken one. Let's see, the Tuesday after Memorial Day, we didn't put out a new episode. The Tuesday of Labor Day weekend or right after the one, I think it's the 31st of August. Um, I'm going to do a listener requested favorite rerun. So no new episode that one. And then there's a third time in 2021 that will be either re- listener requested favorite or no new episode because my editing company only does four episodes a month and putting out an episode every single week is exhausting. <laughs> oh yeah. It's a lot of work. We, it um, is, but thankfully I have the all authors with lots of great people to talk to, sure to tap do. into. <laughs> you sure do. What about transcription? Do you do transcription? Um, the hosting company that I use puts out an AI generated one and it's not bad. So, you know, if you need to read those, it's possible. Yeah, that's, that's good. not always. That's important. We tried, to, I tried to do that in the beginning and it was like a five hour process. So that was not yeah and then we uh, one of my partners transcribed the virtual q a which um recently released on the podcast and that took her a long time she was just flabbergasted by the whole process because it does ai generate for you 
you know, the language, but then it's so many inaccuracies. You got to go back in and correct, make so many corrections that it takes forever. So until that gets better, not really something that we can provide. Although like, as I mostly, as an aside, I just, I mostly, <laughs> sorry, we got a zoom lag yeah, going here. That's all right. <laughs> I use mostly use mine for search engine optimization, but I also had the benefit of talking to the des, the development team about the um, AI generated transcripts, and it was hysterical because in the beginning, it would choose all kinds of funky words other than Alzheimer's. And I had a gentleman who was uh, Greek born, British raised. So he had a very unique accent. And I also have a, a regular geriatrician who is Russian, Armenian, but British raised, who also has a very unique accent. And the AI just like could not figure out what those people were trying to say when it came to words like Alzheimer's and stuff. So I talked to the development team and I and I pointed to these specific episodes where I was getting all kinds of funky words <laughs> instead of Alzheimer's and it really helped them improve it. So that was kind of fun in. You, yeah. So like I said, they're not perfect. If somebody pauses long enough, it thinks there's a period. And so then it'll start a sentence with a fragment, but if you just read it and kind of ignore the funky punctuation, it's, it's pretty good. It's, it's much better than it was early in 2020 when they first released it. So, yeah, you know. we were wondering if it might just be easier to have a person transcribe it, you know, while they listen, somebody who's got that skill that's able to just type in while they, as they listen. I but, did that for a while and that was definitely better, but it was definitely a lot more money. So, yeah, and it's a <laughs> lot of time. Yeah. But I was listening to, as, as an aside, I listened to this podcast the other day. It was, Guy Kawasaki's Remarkable People. And he interviewed a woman who was the first blind and deaf person to attend and graduate from Harvard Law School. I think I saw a blurb about her. Yeah. And so she was, it was really wonderful. And she's like from Af African descent. And she was talking, she said that the most important thing is to provide a transcript because people who, uh, you know, can't hear are like left out of the entire thing. Yeah, that's, yeah, we, there's a lot of things we need to fix. Big lifts. <laughs> like you, you could, you could make yourself crazy trying to figure out while well, trying to solve all these problems. So I, I try to focus on Alzheimer's awareness and supporting caregivers because there's only so many things you can do. That's it. And you're doing it well. So thank you very much. It's great speaking with you again and sharing all of your hard-won knowledge with our audience. And I hope everybody checks out FadingMemoriesPodcast.com. You'll find her on <laughs> Apple, Spotify, all of the popular podcast platforms. And follow, listen, and review. So thanks, Jennifer. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to Untangling Alzheimer's and Dementia, an Alz Authors podcast. For more details on this episode, please see the show notes. If you enjoyed the podcast, please leave a review and subscribe to it wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. For more information on Alz Authors, please visit allsauthors.com. While you're there, be sure to browse our online bookstore, where you will find hundreds of carefully vetted books on Alzheimer's and Dementia. You can also find us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Please email your thoughts on the podcast to allsauthors at gmail.com. We are a 501c3 charitable organization totally reliant on donations to do what we do. If our author's stories move you, please consider contributing to our cause. Remember, you are not alone. One can sing a lonely song, but we chose to form a choir and create harmony. 